five things that happened after Jesus died. Number one, the centurion's declaration of faith. When Jesus died, it wasn't just an end, but a beginning of something transformative for humanity. One of the most striking reactions to Jesus' death was that of the Roman centurion who, upon witnessing these events, declared, Surely he was the Son of God. Matthew 27 verse 54 So who was this centurion? In Roman times, a centurion was a military officer, kind of like a captain in charge of about a hundred soldiers. Picture a tough, seasoned soldier, someone who's seen it all when it comes to life and death. Now, this particular centurion was present at Jesus' crucifixion. Crucifixion, by the way, was a brutal form of Roman execution reserved for slaves, criminals, and rebels. It was designed to be slow, painful, and public. A stark warning to anyone who might challenge Roman authority. The Bible, particularly in the Gospel of Mark chapter 15, gives us a vivid picture of that day. Jesus was arrested, tried, and condemned to die. He was nailed to a cross, a common method in those days for executing criminals. The place was Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Mark 15, 22. Imagine the grim scene, three crosses against the sky, soldiers and a crowd of onlookers. Jesus was in the middle with two criminals on either side. As Jesus hung there, the sky turned dark for three hours, an eerie and unsettling phenomenon. Mark 15 verse 33 says, At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Now, here's where our centurion comes into the picture. He was right there, probably ensuring that the execution went as planned. He had likely overseen many such crucifixions. It was part of his job. But this one was different. When Jesus finally died, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark 15 verse 34 This wasn't just a cry of agony. It was a profound expression of feeling abandoned in his darkest hour. The centurion was watching all this, and when he saw how Jesus died, something remarkable happened. Mark 15 verse 39 tells us, and when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Can you imagine what must have been going through his mind? A tough Roman soldier who was used to seeing death saw something that made him question all he believed before. It's like at that moment the centurion saw beyond the ordinary. He recognized something divine, something extraordinary in Jesus' death. It's not every day that a Roman officer declares a crucified man to be the Son of God. It speaks volumes about the impact of Jesus' final moments in those who were there. The story is significant for a few reasons. First, it's a powerful testimony from an unexpected source. The centurion wasn't a follower of Jesus. He was part of the machine that was executing him. Yet he couldn't help but acknowledge the truth in front of him. Second, this moment reflects a turning point, a crack in the Roman perception of power and authority. The centurion's declaration is like a light shining through the darkness of that day, a recognition of Jesus' true identity despite the apparent defeat of the crucifixion. Lastly, it's a story of realization and revelation. The centurion, with his simple yet profound statement, becomes a symbol of the universal impact of Jesus' life and death. He represents the idea that anyone, regardless of background or beliefs, can come to recognize the truth of who Jesus is. This declaration from a Roman soldier, likely a pagan, is significant. It symbolizes the universal impact of Jesus' death, reaching beyond the Jewish community to the wider world. It reminds us that Jesus' message and salvation are for everyone, 
regardless of background or belief. Isn't it reassuring to know that Jesus' sacrifice is inclusive? Number 2. The Darkness What happened? Imagine a scene. Jesus, the Son of God, had just been crucified. A cruel and painful death reserved for criminals. His followers and loved ones stood at a distance, their hearts heavy with grief and confusion. The sky, as if mourning with them, turned dark. It was a moment of sadness, but also the turning point in a story that would change the world forever. This darkness that fell during Jesus' crucifixion is really thought-provoking, isn't it? In the Bible, darkness often has a deeper meaning, beyond just the absence of light. When it comes to Jesus' death, this darkness could be seen as representing several significant things. First off, darkness in the Bible is frequently associated with judgment and God's displeasure. Think about how, in the Old Testament, darkness was one of the plagues sent to Egypt, Exodus 10 verses 21 to 23. It's like a sign that something serious and unique is happening, something that's not just a regular event. So when darkness fell as Jesus was crucified, it's like a signal that this moment was a significant act of judgment. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness all over the earth until the ninth hour, and the sun was darkened. Luke 23, verses 44 to 45. Another way to look at it is as the importance of Jesus' sacrifice. This wasn't just any moment. It was a time when the Son of God was taking on the sins of the world. That's pretty heavy to imagine. The darkness can be seen as reflecting the weight of sin and the sorrow of this moment. Also, this darkness represents the sorrow and mourning of creation itself. It's as if the natural world was responding to the injustice and sadness of Jesus' death. The Creator was being crucified, and the creation itself was reacting. The darkness at Jesus' crucifixion was about judgment, the gravity of sin, and the mourning of creation. It's not just a dramatic backdrop, it's a unique message about what was happening at that moment. Link to God's Punishment on Pharaoh The Old Testament is full of stories and predictions that are similar to the events in the New Testament. This connection makes interesting stories. A good example is the use of darkness as a sign. It shows up in both the Old Testament and during the time when Jesus was crucified in the New Testament. Where in the Old Testament is the similar darkness mentioned? Cast your mind back to one of the most dramatic episodes, the plagues of Egypt, specifically the ninth plague as recounted in Exodus 10 verses 21 to 29. Here, God tells Moses to reach his hand towards the sky. This causes a very thick darkness to cover Egypt for three days, so dark that it feels like you can touch it. Can you imagine it? A darkness that's almost tangible, not just a lack of light, but a presence in itself. People could not see each other, and for three days, no one left his place. Exodus 10 verse 23. The darkness served as a divine judgment against Pharaoh and Egypt, a demonstration of God's power and a sign of liberation for the Israelites. Fast forward to the New Testament, to the moment of Jesus' crucifixion. As Jesus hung on the cross, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. This wasn't just normal darkness. It was like the whole world got dark in the middle of the day. This unusual event happened when Christ died. Think of it this way. Before good things happened, there was darkness. Like in Egypt, before the Israelites were freed from slavery, it was dark. And before Jesus sacrificed himself to save people from their sins, there was darkness at Calvary. It's interesting how darkness, which usually seems bad, can actually mean something hopeful and good is about to happen. Also, consider the timing. 
The story of Egypt being dark for three days is similar to the story of Jesus being in a tomb for three days. It's like the first story was a hint or a sign of a bigger story that would happen later with Jesus. In both narratives, darkness is not the end. In Egypt it lifted, leading to the Exodus. At Calvary, it gave way to the resurrection. It's almost as if the Bible is telling us that in our darkest moments, hope is just around the corner. So, what can we take from this? Perhaps it's the reminder that God's plans are often hidden in the shadows, waiting to emerge into the light. Or maybe it's the reassurance that even in our darkest times, there's a purpose and a promise of liberation and new life. What do you think? Could the tough times you faced in life lead to big positive changes? Connection to the Feast of the Passover The darkness at Jesus' crucifixion is deeply intertwined with the Feast of Passover. Now, why is this linked to Passover? To understand this, we need to step back into the history of the Israelites. Passover is a very important holiday in the Jewish religion. It celebrates the time when the Israelites were freed from being slaves in Egypt. The central event of Passover is the Passover lamb, a sacrifice made as a sign of God's promise to spare the Israelites from the final plague that struck Egypt, the death of the firstborn. Here's where the link becomes clear. Jesus' crucifixion that happened during Passover isn't a coincidence. In the Bible, Jesus is often referred to as the Lamb of God. John the Baptist introduced Jesus with these words, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1 verse 29 Jesus' death is similar to the way the Passover lamb was killed in the past. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb spared the Israelites, the shedding of Christ's blood is seen as delivering humanity from sin. But why darkness? In the Bible, darkness often represents God's displeasure and God's judgment on sin. The darkness represents the sadness and hopelessness in a world without Jesus. This means that Jesus brings light and hope to the world. Once more Jesus addressed the crowd, he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. John 8 verse 12. Jesus' death, therefore, casts the world temporarily into darkness, both literally and spiritually. But the story doesn't end in darkness. Just as the Passover led to the liberation of the Israelites, the resurrection of Jesus brings hope and light back into the world. It's a beautiful narrative of redemption and renewal. Isn't it interesting how Passover and the crucifixion, even though they happened hundreds of years apart, are so closely related? The Passover lamb's blood brought physical liberation to the Israelites, while Jesus' sacrifice is seen as bringing spiritual liberation to all humanity. The darkness at the crucifixion symbolizes the gravity of this moment, a world lost in sin but also sets the stage for the triumphant return of the light, Jesus' resurrection. Therefore, the darkness at Jesus' crucifixion is a unique sign that links back to the Passover. It signifies judgment, the seriousness of Jesus' sacrifice, and the temporary absence of the light of the world. But, just as the Passover story didn't end with the plagues, our belief in Jesus doesn't end with the crucifixion. The resurrection brings light and hope, much like the liberation of the Israelites in Egypt. Significance for the darkness and what that means The darkness that enveloped the land immediately after Jesus' crucifixion is one of those moments in the Bible that captures the imagination and provokes deep thought. What is its significance and what does it mean? First. Jesus, after being betrayed, tried, and condemned, was crucified. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. Similar accounts are in Mark 15 verse 33 and Luke 23 verses 44 to 45. This wasn't a typical event. It was midday, 
a time when the sun is at its brightest, so why the sudden darkness? The timing is also crucial. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 explains, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. It's really touching when Jesus was carrying the sins of the world, everything went dark. When he was crucified, it was like the light was momentarily extinguished, leaving the world in darkness. Doesn't this make you wonder about the spiritual implications? Was this a physical manifestation of the spiritual darkness that sin brings? Moreover, this event fulfilled the Old Testament prophecy. In that day, declares the Sovereign Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. Amos 8 verse 9 Could this darkness be a fulfillment of this prophecy? indicating that Jesus' crucifixion was part of God's divine plan for salvation? The darkness is significant because of what followed. The darkness lasted three hours, and then Jesus cried out and gave up his spirit. The darkness was temporary, just like the separation between God and humanity that Jesus came to bridge. His resurrection, which followed shortly after, brought light back into the world both literally and figuratively. Isn't it amazing to think that the worst times in history were just the beginning of the best ones? The dark sky when Jesus was crucified is full of meaning. It shows how God feels about wrongdoings, what the world is without Jesus, and that God and people were separated for a short time. It strongly shows how important Jesus' death was and the hope his coming back to life brings. The impact of Jesus' death on nature is quite mysterious, isn't it? It's like nature itself was reacting to this monumental event. Impacts of Jesus' death on nature For starters, remember how the Bible talks about darkness covering the land? Isn't it intriguing to think about the middle of the day turning as dark as night? It's like the sun itself was morning. And then imagine the ground shaking and rocks splitting apart at the very moment of Jesus' death. It's as if the earth itself was responding to something extraordinary happening, right? These events are like nature's way of acknowledging the significance of the death of Jesus. It's not every day that you hear about the natural world reacting in such a dramatic way. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? about the deeper connection between spiritual events and the physical world. The day Jesus died was marked by a series of extraordinary events that went beyond just his crucifixion. It's almost like the entire world was responding to what was happening. These events are deeply significant. It signified the old covenant giving way to the new and the message that through Jesus' sacrifice, everyone now had direct access to God. This moment, with its accompanying natural phenomena, emphasizes the significance of Jesus' death. It's not just a historical event, it's a turning point that reshaped religious thought and understanding. These extraordinary occurrences highlight the importance of what was happening. The death of Jesus was not just the execution of a man, but a moment that changed the course of history and spiritual belief. Now. Let's take a look at the exact events that happened when Jesus died. Number 3. The Torn Veil What happened? When Jesus died, the Bible recounts an extraordinary event, the tearing of the veil in the temple. This moment is rich in significance. First, picture the temple in Jerusalem, the heart of Jewish worship. Inside, there was a special curtain or veil separating the Holy of Holies, where God's presence was believed to reside from the rest of the temple. This veil was not just a thin fabric, but a thick, elaborate material, signifying the separation between God and humanity due to sin. Now imagine the moment of Jesus' death on the cross. This was no small event. The veil tearing from top to bottom not bottom to top as if done by human hands, signified divine intervention. 
But what does this dramatic act mean? Connection to Old Testament The tearing of the temple's veil at the very moment of Jesus' death is deeply rooted in the Old Testament traditions. To understand its full significance, let's dive into the narrative and connect the dots. First, let's set the scene. In the Old Testament, the temple in Jerusalem was the focal point of Jewish religious life. The most sacred part of the temple was the Holy of Holies separated by a veil. This veil was no ordinary curtain. It was a thick, ornate fabric that served as a physical and symbolic barrier between God and humanity. Only the high priest could enter this sacred space, and that too just once a year, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. Leviticus 16 verse 2 to 34. This was a continuous reminder of the barrier sin created between God and humanity. But why did this change happen with Jesus' death? Jesus' death tore down this barrier of sin. His sacrifice, unlike the repetitive animal sacrifices, was once and for all, enough to make up for the wrongdoings of all people. This act of the veil tearing was like God saying, This way to me is now open. Moreover, the tearing of the veil represents the accessibility of God to all people. Before, only the high priest had this once-a-year access to God's presence. But now, through Jesus, everyone has direct access to God. Isn't it remarkable to think that we can now approach God directly because of what Jesus did? What does torn veil mean? Why did the earth shake, and why was the curtain of the temple torn in two? To understand this, we need to look into the context of this occurrence. The temple curtain, a massive veil, separated the Holy of Holies, the most sacred part of the temple where it was believed God himself resided, from the rest of the temple. Only the high priest could enter this space and only once a year to offer sacrifices for the sins of the people. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 27 verses 50 to 51, we find an exact description of these events. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks were split. Now, think about what Jesus' death signifies. According to the Bible, Jesus was the perfect sacrifice, atoning for the sins of humanity. The book of Hebrews draws this connection explicitly. See the connection? Jesus' death tore down that barrier of sin, just as the veil in the temple was torn. But there's more. The fact that the veil was torn from top to bottom suggests divine action, not human. It's as if God himself were tearing down the barrier. This act symbolizes the end of the old covenant and the dawn of the new. No longer would rituals and sacrifices of the Old Testament be needed. Jesus' sacrifice changed everything. The tearing of the veil also signifies a new era of grace. In the Old Testament, the law was central. Adherence to the law was the way to maintain a relationship with God. But now, with the veil torn, it's about grace through faith in Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9 So, in simple terms, the tearing of the veil is like God opening a door that had been closed since the fall of Adam and Eve. God removes the barrier, inviting us into a personal, intimate relationship with Him. What does this mean for us today? Jesus' sacrifice created a direct path for people to connect with God themselves without needing someone else to help them do it. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is, his body. Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 20. 
It means that the barrier of sin separating us from God has been removed. Through Jesus, we can have a personal relationship with God. We no longer need a human mediator like a high priest of old. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. 1 Timothy 2 verse 5 The tearing of the veil was like God opening a previously locked door and inviting us in. It's a powerful image of invitation, reconciliation, and new beginnings. The old ways of separation and limited access were gone, replaced by an open invitation to a personal, direct relationship with God. This invites us to reflect. Do we live in the freedom and access that Jesus' sacrifice provided? Or do we live as if the veil is still there, separating us from God? It's a question worth pondering. Number 4. The Resurrection of the Dead The earthquake and rocks breaking apart weren't just normal events in nature. They were indications of a huge event happening in a spiritual world. Can you picture how amazed and scared the people who saw these things happening must have felt? The tombs broke open, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Matthew 27 verse 52 to 53 This is a fascinating and somewhat mysterious part of what happened on the day Jesus died. It signifies that Jesus' death was not just a tragedy, but a victory over death itself. The revival of these sacred individuals happened before Jesus came back to life, which took place three days after. Who were these people? These were people who had passed away, some probably long ago, but were suddenly alive again. It's like a scene where all hope seems lost, and then, suddenly, a miraculous twist. Now, who exactly were these people? There are no names or backstories of these people, they are simply described as holy people. This term likely refers to faithful believers, maybe prophets or righteous people from the past. You know, the kind of people who lived their lives with and for God. But why did this happen? Here's where it gets really interesting. This event was like a teaser, a sneak peek of what was about to happen. Jesus himself was going to be resurrected three days later. It's like these resurrected people were setting the stage for the main event, Jesus' own resurrection. Think of it as a powerful sign that death isn't the end of the story, not for Jesus and not for those who believe in him. And what happened to these resurrected people? They appear to many in Jerusalem, which must have been astonishing. Imagine seeing someone you mourned back alive and walking around. The whole event speaks to the power of what Jesus was about to do. His resurrection wasn't just a one-off miracle, it was a game-changer, a sign that life triumphs over death. It's like the resurrection of these holy people was saying, if God can do this for us, just wait and see what he has in store with Jesus. Connection to Old Testament how is the resurrection of the dead at the time of Jesus' death connected to the Old Testament? The Old Testament is full of clues and forecasts about events that would be described in the New Testament, like Jesus' life, his death, and coming back to life. Let's look at the big picture. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies and signs that point towards Jesus. It's like a long story with clues sprinkled throughout leading up to a big reveal. The resurrection of the dead when Jesus died can be seen as one of those big reveal moments. Now, about the resurrection of the dead. The Bible doesn't give a direct Old Testament prophecy about this specific event, but it does talk a lot about resurrection in general. For instance, in the book of Daniel, there's this really interesting verse, Daniel 12 verse 2, which says, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. This verse is like a sneak peek into the idea that there will be a resurrection, 
a waking up from death. Then there's Isaiah 26 verse 19, which says, But your dead will live, Lord, their bodies will rise. Let those who dwell in the dust wake up and shout for joy. Again, it's like the Old Testament is dropping hints that the dead will rise again. These verses set the stage for what happened when Jesus died. It's like the Old Testament was saying, Hey, keep an eye out, because resurrection is going to be a big deal. And then, in the New Testament, when Jesus dies and these people are raised from the dead, it's like a confirmation, a powerful sign that what was promised or hinted at in the Old Testament is coming true. The resurrection of the dead at Jesus' death also emphasizes a major theme in the Bible, God's power over life and death. The Old Testament often talks about God as the giver of life and the one who has dominion over death. For example, in Deuteronomy 32 verse 39, God says, See now that I, I am He, and there is no God besides me. It is I who put to death and I who give life. I have wounded and it is I who heal. And there is no one who can deliver from the power of my hand. So when these people rise from the dead in the New Testament, it's like a dramatic demonstration of this power. Jesus at the first fruit of the dead. Imagine we're piecing together a puzzle from a story that's spread across two parts the Old and the New Testament. In the New Testament, particularly 1 Corinthians 15 verse 20, it says, But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. This term, first fruits, is a farming analogy. It refers to the very first portion of a harvest, which was often offered to God as a sign of gratitude and the hope for more to come. It's like saying, Here's the first and best part, and there's plenty more where that came from. So when Jesus is described as the first fruits, it implies he's the first example of what's to come in terms of resurrection. He's the proof that life after death is real and not just a one-time deal. It's like if you see the first flower bloom in spring, you know the rest of the flowers are on their way. For example, the book of Leviticus chapter 23 verse 10 talks about presenting the first fruits to God as an offering. This was a symbol of trust and gratitude, acknowledging that God provided the whole harvest. Now, flash forward to the New Testament. When Jesus is described as the first fruits of the dead, it's like saying he is the first and best example of what's to come for all who believe in him. Just as the first fruits were a promise of more harvest to come, Jesus' resurrection is seen as a promise of a future resurrection for believers. It's like Jesus is paving the way, showing what's in store for those who follow him. This connection is quite interesting because it shows the continuity between the Old and New Testaments. It's not just random. There's a deep, meaningful link. The concept of first fruits in the Old Testament sets the stage for understanding Jesus' resurrection in the New Testament. It's like a thread that ties the whole story of the Bible together. So, when we talk about Jesus as the first fruits of the dead, we're saying that he's the first example of this incredible promise of life after death, a promise that's been hinted at and built up since the times of the Old Testament. It's a way of understanding what happened with Jesus wasn't just a one-off event. It's part of a much bigger God-sized plan. Number 5. The Empty Tomb What happened? Have you ever wondered about the story behind the empty tomb of Jesus? It's like a real-life mystery, full of suspense and surprises. Picture this. Jesus, the man who performed miracles and spoke of love and forgiveness, has just been crucified. His followers are devastated, confused, and scared. What do they do now? It all starts with a man named Joseph of Arimathea. The Bible describes him as a rich man and a member of the Jewish council. But interestingly, 
he was also a secret follower of Jesus. Brave, right? Jesus' body taken. Joseph goes to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, and asks for Jesus' body. Matthew 27, verses 57 to 58. Can you picture how brave he was to do that? He was basically revealing that he followed Jesus, which was really risky back then. Pilate agrees, and Joseph gets the body. He's joined by Nicodemus, another secret follower, who brings about 75 pounds of spices for burial. That's a lot of spices showing great respect for Jesus. John 19 verse 39. They take Jesus' body and wrap it in clean linen cloth with the spices, in accordance with Jewish burial customs. Then they lay his body in a new tomb that Joseph had carved out of rock. This was a tomb where no one had ever been laid before, fulfilling the prophecy in Isaiah 53 verse 9 about Jesus being buried with the rich. His grave was assigned with the wicked, but he was with a rich man in his death, because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. As they roll a big stone in front of the tomb's entrance, you can imagine the sadness and finality they must have felt. But, little did they know, this was just the beginning of something extraordinary. Sealing of the tomb The next day, the chief priests and Pharisees, worried that Jesus' followers might steal his body and claim he had risen from the dead as Jesus had predicted his resurrection, go to Pilate. They get permission to secure the tomb and set a guard. Matthew 27 verses 62 to 66. So, they seal the tomb and place guards there. It's like they're trying to make extra sure that the Jesus story ends here. But can you really put a seal on a miracle? Women visiting the tomb. Now it's the first day of the week, just after dawn. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary go to look at the tomb. Now after the Sabbath, near the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. Matthew 28 verse 1. Imagine their shock when they find an angel sitting on the rolled-away stone with the guards out cold. The angel says, But the angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he has risen just as he said he would. Come, see the place where he was lying. Matthew 28 verses 5 to 6 the women, filled with fear and great joy, run to tell Jesus' disciples. But here's another surprise. Jesus meets them on the way. He greets them, and they worship him. Jesus tells them not to be afraid and to inform his disciples to go to Galilee where he will see them. Matthew 28 verses 9 to 10. Imagine their amazement and excitement. Bribery of the Chief Priest Meanwhile, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. The chief priests, in a bit of a panic, bribed the soldiers to say that Jesus' disciples came during the night and stole his body while they were sleeping. Matthew 28 verses 11 to 15. They are attempting to hide the truth, but somehow, the truth always seems to reveal itself, right? Lesson. The story of the empty tomb is not just a tale of a missing body. It's a story about promises fulfilled, about the power of faith, and about a miracle that changed the course of history. The empty tomb symbolizes hope, renewal, and the triumph of life over death. It's a story that invites us to ask ourselves, what do we believe? What do we make of this man, Jesus, who claimed to be the Son of God, and then seemed to prove it in the most dramatic way possible. The empty tomb of Jesus is more than an ending. It's a beginning. It's the start of a new understanding of life, death, and what lies beyond. It challenges our notions of what's possible and calls us to look beyond what we can see and touch. So, what do you think? Is the story of the empty tomb just an ancient legend? 
Or is it a moment in history that defies explanation? Is it a story of human deception? Or is it a divine revelation? The Empty Tomb of Jesus is a story that has fascinated people for centuries, and it continues to be a source of wonder, debate, and faith. It's a story that invites us to explore the depths of our own beliefs and to consider the possibility of love and a power that goes beyond the grave. Connection to Old Testament How is Jesus' empty tomb linked to the Old Testament? The Old Testament is brimming with themes and prophecies that the Bible points directly to Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. So let's dig into some of these connections. The Sacrificial System The Old Testament is filled with sacrifices, especially for the atonement of sins. Remember the Passover lamb in Exodus 12? It was sacrificed to save the Israelites in Egypt. This concept of a sacrificial lamb is seen as foreshadowing of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice. When Jesus is crucified and then resurrected, leaving an empty tomb, it means he's the final Passover lamb, bringing salvation not just to Israel, but to all of humanity. Prophecies about the Messiah The Old Testament is like a treasure for messianic prophecies. For instance, Isaiah 53 is a chapter rich with descriptions that points to Jesus. It talks about a suffering servant who bears the sins of many. And guess what? This servant is described as being cut off from the land of the living. Isaiah 53 verse 8 Could this be an early hint of Jesus' death and subsequent resurrection? Jonah and the Big Fish Here's a story that Jesus himself linked to his death and resurrection. In Matthew 12, verse 40, Jesus says, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Isn't it fascinating how Jesus connects the Old Testament story to his own experience? Jonah's time in the fish is seen as a symbol of Jesus' time in the tomb. For you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, nor will you let your faithful one see decay. Psalm 16 verse 10 This is seen as a prediction of Jesus' resurrection. It's like saying, the Messiah won't be left in the grave to decay. He'll rise again, leaving an empty tomb. The Binding of Isaac Remember the story of Abraham and Isaac in Genesis 22. Abraham is asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, but is stopped at the last moment by God who provides a ram instead. This story is seen as a parallel to God offering his son, Jesus, as a sacrifice. The key difference? In Jesus' case, the sacrifice is completed, but then overturned by the resurrection, symbolized by the empty tomb. Resurrection Hints Though the Old Testament doesn't explicitly talk about resurrection as we understand it from the New Testament, it does have moments where resurrection is hinted at. Take Ezekiel's vision of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. It's a powerful image of life being breathed into dead bones, symbolizing the revival of the nation of Israel. Could this also be a symbol representing the resurrection leading up to Jesus' empty tomb? Understanding the Empty Tomb So, how do we wrap our heads around all these connections? It's like the Old Testament laid down a trail leading to the grand revelation of the empty tomb. The Old Testament sets up themes of sacrifice, redemption, and resurrection, all of which find their fulfillment in the New Testament story of Jesus, especially in the discovery of his empty tomb. Is the empty tomb just a New Testament story, or is it the climax of a narrative that began with the first pages of the Old Testament? For a lot of people, it's obvious that the Old Testament was leading up to this event, even though it wasn't directly stated. The empty tomb isn't just an isolated event. Application Today 
It's a reminder of the immense sacrifice Jesus made in the incredible power of his death and resurrection. Through his suffering and death, Jesus broke down the barriers of sin and death that separated humanity from God. The torn curtain, the earthquake, the resurrection of the saints and the empty tomb are powerful symbols of this new reality. In the midst of all this, it's important to ask ourselves, how does this story affect my life? Do I truly understand the magnitude of what Jesus did for me on the cross? The events that immediately followed Jesus' death are more than just historical facts. They are invitations to reflect on our own lives and our relationship with God. So, why do these events matter to us today? Each of these occurrences goes beyond mere historical facts. They carry timeless truths and promises. Number one, the torn veil tells us that we can approach God directly without fear or hesitation. Number two, the earthquakes and split rocks remind us that Jesus' death and resurrection were world-changing events, calling us to shake off our old ways. Number three, the raised saints speak of the hope we have in life after death, a comfort in times of loss and motivation to live life with an eternal perspective. Number four, the centurion's declaration invites us to acknowledge Jesus' divine identity and its implication for our lives. Number five, the women as witness challenge us to recognize the value of every individual in God's plan. The story of what happened immediately after Jesus died is filled with divine intervention and deep significance. It's a story that invites us to think about the depth of God's love for us, the power of Jesus' sacrifice, and the transformative impact it has on our lives. As we think about this, we can't help but be filled with gratitude at the incredible story of redemption that unfolded on that fateful day. In a nutshell, these events form the foundation of our faith in Christ and have implications for our spiritual journey. They speak of access, transformation, hope, inclusion and value, themes as relevant today as they were two millennia ago. Each event invites us to reflect, respond and reorient our lives in light of the incredible story of Jesus' death and resurrection. Isn't it amazing how these ancient events continue to resonate and impact our lives today? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, in this moment we gather in your presence, hearts open and spirits yearning for your touch. We reflect on the mysteries and miraculous events that followed the death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and seek to find meaning and inspiration in them for our lives today. For the darkness that covered the land representing deep sadness and hopelessness, we too experience moments of overwhelming darkness, times when hope seems distant and joy feels lost. These times remind us that just as the darkness eventually lifted, our moments of hopelessness are not eternal. Grant us the courage to hold on to faith, even when the light is dim. As we think of the temple veil tearing in two, we are in amazement with this act. The barrier between the holy and the common, the divine and the mortal, torn apart. In our lives, let this be a reminder that there is no division too great, no barrier too strong that your love cannot penetrate. Let us help to tear down the walls in our hearts of bitterness, pride and fear, so that we may stand in your holy presence with nothing between us. We recall the earthquake, a testament to the power of your might. In our lives, shake the foundations of our complacency and awaken us to your purpose for our lives. Let this shaking not be one of destruction, but of transformation, breaking the chains of our limitations, freeing us to move forward in your grace. In the miraculous resurrection of the dead, 
we find a message of hope that defies the finality of death. In our daily struggles, let this miracle remind us that no situation is beyond your redeeming power. In moments of loss and sorrow, comfort us with the assurance that in you there is life beyond death, joy beyond sorrow, and peace beyond understanding. And finally, in the resurrection of Jesus, the cornerstone of our faith, we find the ultimate symbol of victory over death and sin. Help us live in the reality of this victory. May the knowledge of Christ's resurrection empower us to face our daily battles with confidence and hope. Let this miracle inspire us to rise above our challenges, to overcome our weaknesses, and live lives that reflect your love and grace. Lord, as we navigate the complexities of our lives, let these miraculous events be a guiding light. In moments of doubt, strengthen our faith. In times of weakness, fortify our spirits. When we are lost, lead us back to you. Help us to be instruments of your peace in this world. Where there is hatred, let us sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is pain, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. May we embody the lessons of these miracles in our actions and interactions. Let us be a source of comfort for those who are in darkness, a bridge for those separated by division, a steady presence in times of change, a beacon of hope in times of trouble, and a testament to your resurrecting power in our daily lives. As we close this prayer, we do so with grateful hearts knowing that you are with us always in our joys and in our struggles. May your love and light guide us today and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. However, many ask, why did Jesus pray to God if he is God? To watch that video, click here.